Hi, this is Chantel Sutherland, and this is Racing Rundown. All right, welcome back to Racing Rundown. Uh, just a quick explanation of the way that events have turned out. Uh, unfortunately, today we're not going to be able to have Gary Stevens. Uh, he was only going to be able to give me about 15, 20 minutes, so uh, we decided to push that off back into September. But as a consolation, we do have uh, jockey Chantel Sutherland on the podcast today. How are you today, Chantel? Good, how are you doing? Uh, I'm doing great. Uh, so... Uh, the first question that I wanted to ask you, Chantel, is how did you get started in horse racing? Um, I grew up on a farm in Canada, and um, my sister and I were show jumpers, and my father had thoroughbreds and standardbreds. He was an owner, and he loved the standardbreds so much he wanted to get a track, and um, when he got, we moved out to the sort of country, he met a really good friend of his who was a veterinarian, and... Uh, a breeder and he was a manager of a big farm that was a training facility uh i ended up working with him and working at summer job galloping thoroughbreds making breaking babies and showing horses at the sales and just got into the business that way and fell in love with the racing so it's the typical i grew up around horses type of thing yeah i mean it's definitely um, I've never seen, you know, jockeys who, other than coming from um, Venezuela or Peru or something like that, or, you know, New Orleans, where they've been introduced to horses that way, um, you know, it's, I've only ever heard of jockeys ever doing it if they've been around horses or they've been on a farm or something like that, becoming a jockey, and I guess that's how you get introduced. Do you remember your first win? I do. I was on a horse... Uh, named uh call me annie and it wasn't what i thought it was going to be like but it was very um in very exciting and um definitely I, it caught me on my first race i became addicted what was your first race like or your first win excuse uh, me well for for most people i think and for myself i thought it'd be loud and be a lot of noise but it's really quiet out there and you can hear probably jockeys talking if they do talk like at this level of your voice level and it's um just really peaceful out there and it's just really quiet which is surprising now the first two years of your career you received the sovereign award for outstanding apprentice jockey which in the united states is the equivalent to the eclipse award uh what was that like to have your talent recognized at that early in your career I think everybody likes to be recognized and our goal and everyone's sort of vision and purpose is to, to do well and to get accomplished and be successful. I did work really hard so it felt good and um, uh, it was what I was striving to do. So when things come to fruition and then to be awarded, I mean, it's such a nice honor and I mean, I, I remember feeling just so happy and just Everything that I had worked so hard for, you know, came about, and uh, I felt proud of myself. Did you always intend to stay in Canada, or what were your plans for your career at that point? I, I thought I was going to always stay in Canada, and then um, I think I got a little bit of the like United States bug when um, I left Canada to become a jockey, and I worked at Angel, and then I saw... You know, I went to Saratoga, and I saw so much more, and, you know, different tracks, and just that the racing was just so big, and there's so many people involved in it. I just loved being around people who loved horse racing as much as I did, and there's just such a culture, and I loved it, and I got addicted to it. Uh, so I always planned to ride in Canada, and then I'd race in the winters in Florida or travel, and... That's what I did, and then it just so happened, um, you know, I, I met Mike Smith, and he kind of took me to California, and that was kind of, I ran into Game On Dude, and 
I just never came back to Canada. We'll get to the, those moments later, but what was it like to work around uh, those all-time greats like Angel Cordero you mentioned? Well, Angel was really awesome. He helped me a lot in my career. The one probably that helped me the most get to the next level was being around people like Gary Stevens, uh, Mike Smith, and Kent Sormo. You know, they'd all hang out together, maybe not as much as they do in they do it in Kentucky. Um, I find that the jockeys a lot, they have quite a big family here and they hang out a lot. We used to do that a little more in California, but the last few years we stopped doing that. But anyway, getting back to why um, they helped me is because we just always talked about horse racing and they would just, you know, show me stuff and, you know, explain races and you just racing with them. I remember racing with Garrett Gomez. I learned so much from him. And just being around that level of athleticism and sportsmanship, you learn, you know, how to be your best and you learn how to behave and act. And it was a, it was a great opportunity. And if you want to be great, I think someone always told me, surround yourself with greatness. Now, when you were younger, I know the biggest race up in Canada is the Queen's Plate. Was there any one particular race that you dreamed about winning, like, per se, the Queen's Plate? Yeah, for sure, the Queen's Plate, uh, the Addo Mile, which is the Canadian International Mile. Um, I love that turf course. I love the uh, the distance. It's an exciting race. Um, but I won a lot of states there, and I'm very excited for what I did accomplish. But yeah, those would be the two that eluded me. The Kentucky Derby here, uh, the Breeders' Cup Classic. <laughs> what uh, When you came to America, what were your expectations for your career here? Uh, well, when I first got to New York, I really wanted to do well. My vision was always to ride for Bob Baffert. I wrote it down a long time ago when I was an apprentice. Um, I wanted to travel the world. I wanted to be an international jockey. And that meant going to Hong Kong, England. And I just loved when I would see Frankie or Dottori or um, Olivier Pelletier and all those guys who travel so much. And I thought it'd be so fun to be a jockey that traveled. Uh, and I was lucky enough to be able to travel. And even now, still, I would still like to travel more. Um, you do have to be, you know, in the standings pretty high to do that. That being said, when you're high in the standings, you don't really want to leave because you're doing well. So it's kind of a catch. But uh, I, I guess my goals were to travel, uh, be in a derby. Uh, hopefully now I would love to win one or just be in one and, you know, be in the Breeders' Cup again. Just, just to be in races that you can do well, make money at, and and for the most part, as you get older, I just I love what I do. I I want to do what makes me happy, and um, this is this is it right now. Still. Now, when you came to California, a lot of people recognized that you had some talent in this country. One of them, in particular, Alan Gutterman, said that. Uh, you had the potential to be the greatest female jockey since Julie Crone. What was it like to be measured up to people like Julie Crone, for example, the all-time winningest female jockey? Well, what Julie did was pretty outstanding, and I feel very, you know, honored to be uh, compared to her or even to be um, suggested that I could be on that level. Uh, she she did amazing things. I think Rosina Probnik is a fantastic rider, um, and that's really kind of him to say. And uh, uh, big shoes to fill. But I think that um, I'm grateful for it. I wish that when I left racing four years ago, when I was on top of the world, I had just, I just wish I had stayed and pursued it a little more. But that's kind of what not the card I was dealt at the time, uh, and it was more a choice to leave. But coming back has been a struggle, and it does take time to get back in. And there's a lot of great young riders that are coming up. And it's just it's a lot of politics, too. It's who you know, the relationships you make. And it takes a lot of time to make and build relationships. And it takes almost like a whole career to build where I've gotten to. So um, it's kind of a bummer a little bit that way. But um, if I stick it out a little more for the next year or so, I think good things could happen, and I really believe, you know, like anything, the most greatest and talented, talented people 
um, work hard and they, you know, prep themselves for the opportunity. And um, I believe, kind of sometimes believe in luck, but not really. I guess it's mostly, you know, preparation versus uh, preparation meets opportunity. And I think that at any moment I could get a good horse. Um, I really love the horses that I'm getting on for Larry Jones. He's really giving me a shot, and Steve Margolis is really giving me a shot. And I like the babies that I'm working, but for other people, the babies won't be seen till the fall. So it it's, it seems like things are going slow, but in in my mind, in my heart, things are going really well. Now, one of your first top horses that you had was an eventual Kentucky Derby winner, Mind That Bird. Uh, back in uh, 2008, his two-year-old season, you won the Gray Stakes, the one of the two-year-old races at Woodbine, a former win in your end for the Breeders' Cup. Uh, what was it like winning that race on him and then going on to the Breeders' Cup with him? Uh, he was a really fun horse to ride. And I really, to make a really quick story, um, when I first got on him, and I love getting on babies because I think I've ridden for a lot of trainers all over the world. And I've learned a lot of different styles. And um, when I rode him... He was really lazy in the morning, and we couldn't get him to work. And then I asked the trainer if we could, you know, have a horse in front of me and I could chase him. And not only did we chase the horse, but I think the light bulb turned on with uh, my nut bird, and he just took off and closed really well. And it's kind of how he ran, and it was very exciting to ride him because he was super athletic and he had a really quick turn of foot. And then when we, you know, he was sold from the Canadians to – uh, eventually, Richard Mandela and his connections. Uh, Richard, you know, stopped me on the racetrack just uh, about a year ago and said, you know, he blamed himself for the Breeders' Cup uh, race that he didn't do well in because he was a lazy horse and he was not a great workhorse. He put more speed into him. And I remember when we broke in that Breeders' Cup race, he went and we were right on, like, close to lead, if not, like, stalking and that wasn't really his style and we didn't have much of a finish that day that also means that we did get bumped by another horse and things happen but um i think his style is really off the pace and clearly you saw it in the derby but uh he was really fun and exciting to ride and i was never worried riding him he he always showed up for me every day or every every time i rode him he was kind of like game on dude he just always showed up and super fun to ride and I feel very grateful for the opportunity. How surprised were you when he won the Kentucky Derby in 2009? Uh, I was kind of, you know, I was really excited, heartbroken, happy, sad. It was just like a flood of tons of different emotions thinking like, what if that was me? It would have been the you know, first girl that I ever win it. And people said, oh, well, you wouldn't have run the same way. I'm like, well, he comes off the pace. Yes, I would have. They're like, oh, you wouldn't have went up the rail. Hard to say. You mean the rail opened up for Calvin? Um, he does ride a great race here in Churchill. Uh, I don't know. I just, I guess it wasn't meant to be that day or just fate eluded me. Um, but I was happy that I was a part of, you know, his whole career. And uh, maybe it wasn't meant to be then and it's still in my future. I'm hoping. <laughs> Now, 2009 was your most successful year by number of victories, but uh, your most successful earning-wise was 2010. What was it like to get to that heights of winning over a million, over seven million and eight million dollars in a single year? Uh, I guess you know when you're in it and you're doing it, you're not really you know thinking about all the money. I mean, of course, it, it's great when you get big checks from the racetrack. It's exciting, it's awesome, it's kind of like the pat on the back that nobody's going to give you other than, you know, it's a very competitive world. People aren't, you know, going to say, you're doing so good all the time. It's usually like this radio shows, podcasts, where you kind of reminisce on all the good things that you've done. But it was, it was great, it was exciting. I felt like, um, I don't know what the word is right now, it's eluding me, uh, when you feel um, accomplished or... Uh, respected, um, that you're, you belong where you're at, which is a pretty high level of racing. And 
it, it felt good. Now, we've mentioned Game On Dude a little bit uh, before this. Uh, 2011, you got the opportunity to ride him in the big cap. How did that play out, you getting the ability to ride him in that race? Well, it started off, um, you know, I've, I've been asking Bob for a while to give me a mount. And he did say, I'll get you on. I'm going to find you on. And, you know, he did say, I do mean it. I'm going to find you on. And, you know, every trainer has the people that they ride. And when you're new... Um, you know, they just can't move people off their horses. They have commitments, and I get that, and I appreciate that. Uh, so you just got to wait your turn, and that's all just continually, you know, working out, being prepared for that opportunity when it happens. And we were on the apron that day watching the horses, and I happened to walk up to Bob, and the big cab came up with uh, a light handicap for Game on Dude. He got him with, like, 15, 115 weight weight and I was the lighter of the jockeys at the time and there was another jockey that you know at that moment couldn't have made the weight so we had asked um you know give me a shot and you did promise me you're gonna give me a horse and Bob that morning said you know I did promise you I was gonna give you a horse and you know he gets him light he's not one of my better horses but you can ride him so he gave my agent the call and then the rest with history. Yeah, I think Bob was pretty wrong with uh, Game On Dude not being one of his better ho- better horses. Uh, in that race, that, there was a lot of controversy in that. At the top of the stretch, you and Mind That Bird were, in, or excuse me, Game On Dude were involved in a bit of a scuffle with another horse, Twirling Candy. What happened, if I'm going to spare everyone from my Trevor Denman impersonation, but when you, quote, shifted out? Yeah, so we came around the turn and, uh, um, I let him, uh, you know, not so much drift, but like we came off the rail a little bit and I went to switch his lead and, uh, the outside horse, um, was running well. And the one in the middle, I believe it was, uh, it was twirling candy that was Joe, in the middle. Yeah, he, that's right. And he said, Suko, right? Said Suko was on with, the outside. Uh, yeah. It was, uh, it was you twirling candy and said Suko. Right. So he was sort of fading, and um, the outside horse didn't move it. Like, he was, you know, keeping his tight line. And that horse, the twirling candy horse, was laboring, and he kind of stepped in, and his shoulder hit my flank, and then it turned me, it turned my, you know, my, my hind end to the left and my front end to the right, which visually it looked like I came over, but the initial contact um, was from the Twirling Candy Horse. Uh, there was controversy about that, but when you actually watch the replay, you see what happens. And then Game On Dude, not only do I grab him and continue on straight again, but he gets hit again and recovers again. And then uh, Victor Spinoza on his horse, the outside horse, passed me, and then I come on back after recovering and nail him at the water. So it's an exciting race where it showed Game On Dude's perseverance, determination, but he, you know, is like a little, you know, a fighter. Like he he was definitely a, a gangster. He, If you were to put a fight to him or try to nose him out, he would dig in really deep to, to, to beat another horse, which, you know, it's what you want in a racehorse, heart, determination, and grit, and he was all that. Now, what was it like? I believe uh, the inquiry was 12 minutes, but what what's it like to sit through an inquiry like that in a big race? And, you know, there was a very high likelihood that you could have been taken down. What was that like to sit through that inquiry? Well, coming into California and being new and being female and riding for Bob Baffert is a huge opportunity. I mean, I wanted to make a splash, and I was definitely making a cannonball move. And this, it was heart-wrenching. It was like, I remember sweating. I remember my mouth was cotton. I was like total electricity going through your body, hoping to God that they see what happened and that they keep my number up. Totally stressful. And um, just adrenaline (laughs) running through your body even after, you know, we had done what we did. So uh, just on a level 10 of 
you know, anxiousness and adrenaline and excitement and nervousness. So level 10 on, on all my emotions. And then when it came through that we were not taken down, having the crowd boo for the first time in my life, walking into the paddock was another <laughs> shocking, you know, emotional moment. And it just was one of the craziest experiments, experiences um, of my racing career, I think. Yeah, I mean, you know, that's the thing with crowds. Like, don't don't mess with their money. They'll they'll love oh. you. If, they'll love you if you don't. <laughs> if you yeah. make them money, they love you. And if you mess with their money, they'll hate you. Uh, I want right. to shift away from the game on dude talk for just a second. Have you ever had anyone at any point like come up to you and gotten like upset at you or been really nasty about a race that say like you cost them a trifecta that would have won them like maybe five figures or something like that? Yes, I have. We had, um, we I we had to be, well, going back to game on dude. The five security guards had to escort me back to the jocks room, and they told me to start running. I go start running, and they're like, "Yep, you messed up the pick six. And there's a lot of mad people. And a guy came to, I guess, he came running at me, and the security guards had to knock him down, and they told me to keep running. And then I was escorted to my car that evening. And um, another time, I've had trainers throw blinkers at me. I had a trainer the other day um, say some really choice words to me after the race in front of the public. I mean, I've had a jockey jump off a horse and uh, try to attack me <laughs> in the clerk of scales room. Um, and they've, I remember that one incident, the jockey had to go to uh, anger management and was suspended for I think 15 days. Um, but yeah, there's been instances where people get upset and um, I haven't been in too many altercations physically, but I've been, um, you know, definitely pushed and uh, yelled at a few times in the jock room. I just want to reiterate what she said earlier uh, when she was talking about uh, leaving Santa Anita after the big cat because there was a little bit of a glitch with the audio. Uh, she was oh. just talking about how she had to be escorted out and how there were a lot of people that were pissed off because she messed up the pick six. You know, nice people, gamblers. <laughs> yeah, I think, uh, you know, if people put a lot of money down and they expect things, but we're, you know, there are, you know, wild animals <laughs> to, uh, to an extent and they have, you know, emotions like all of us and... You know, there's a lot going on. There's just not just my emotions. There's, you know, 10 other, 18 other jockeys and all their horses' emotions. And it's just, I don't know, I think it's accolades to all the jockeys that we are able to not only keep the horses straight, but protect each other and ride good races. And um, I really enjoy riding here at Churchill. I think these jockeys are by far the nicest and uh, greatest, I mean, I've ridden with great riders, but I just love the room. Everybody gets along, and the guys are just super respectful, and it's just a pleasure to to ride with them. And their talents are, I mean, they're great riders, and it, it feels safe out there. And you can talk to any one of them, and they treat me with so much respect. So I'm really grateful to be in this room and to be at this level, and and to be respected by them. Now, I want to ship back to Game On, dude. You, with him in 2011, I think that 2011 was probably his best racing season overall, but in 2011, you swept both the big races at Santa Anita for older horses, the Santa Anita Handicap and the Goodwood, back when it was still called the Goodwood. What was it like to win the Goodwood with him? Uh, it was, you know, it was exciting to win all of those races and the Hollywood Gold Cup was pretty special too because it was at Hollywood and that doesn't exist anymore. Um, they were just, I felt like, and I don't even realize it now, I realize it now what I was accomplishing, but at the time you don't really, you don't really realize, but I knew, like, I, of course I knew I was doing great and everything was awesome. It's just, uh, I don't know, it's, you're just in it, and it's happening, and you're riding and racing, but now I, I think I appreciate it more now. Now, you mentioned earlier Mike Smith. Uh, you guys were in a, we're getting to this now, you guys were in a, a well-publicized uh, re former relationship that was partially portrayed on the reality show Jockeys. Before we talk about Mike, what was it like to be on that 
show jockeys that is not around anymore, but was quite an interesting show. You know, I love the show. I We did a lot of hard work with that show, and it just happened that the producers of that show made the show The Hills, and The Hills just came back. It's called New Beginning. And that show and those producers, you know, when they came to approach us with the Animal Planet idea, I was like, these people are for real. Like, these are real producers. They, they know what they're doing, and I think it's going to be a great show. So I convinced Mike to convince the other jockeys, and we all – you know, all worked really hard at it, and I thought it was great for racing, um, and I think something like that would be great now to help our industry, because it shows, you know, the the love of horses, and it shows, it shows a lot of how much hard work goes into it, and how much the trainers love the horses, the jockeys, and it, it is our life, and we really, it's everything that we do, and to be sort of I feel like we're, you know, on the chopping block right now with, you know, the public and, you know, PETA, and I feel it's, it's a bit unfair. Um, I know that in every industry there's good and bad, and maybe we need to show more of the good and what, what we do to, you know, there's so much more good than I think that's what's being shown that's unfortunate. And maybe we haven't done a good job in doing that. And I think that's something that we as a community need to work on. Um, and uh, anyway, getting back to the show, I thought the show was great. Uh, I actually sometimes can't watch myself on it because going back, I'm like, what was I thinking with that hairstyle? But uh, it, was, it was good. And I think I learned, you know, Mike and I were, you know, going through that whole relationship thing. And it was real. There was some stuff that was, uh, you know, they would they would ask you questions or give a little note to somebody in the group to ask you this question. They focused on certain ideas and themes that were they were trying to create or focus on. And I think the Joe Talamo, Elizabeth Talamo thing was fun because that, that was their target market. It was a younger generation. And they ended up getting married and having kids. So that was real. And Kayla Straw, her struggle uh, was very real. And... You know, the relationship that I was going through with Mike, I mean, that was, it was a real struggle and, you know, it didn't end up working out, but I don't regret it. I learned a lot and um, I wish they would do another jockeys. I'm not sure who would be in it, but I think it'd be great for racing. I just know that it's a lot of work to do that and it takes the whole community to come together to work with that because it's, you know, you're being filmed, you have to do, you know, think scenes over again, you have to wear microphones and sometimes trainers get aggravated because you know the horses are animals and you know we can't do the second shot so you have to try and make it work and but I thought it was great and I meet kids all the time that say I saw you on jockeys and that's why I got in the industry and I think we need to get that younger generation into racing I think we might have we might have lost a step there too now you and Mike finally did end that relationship in 2011. Del Mar actually approached you guys with the opportunity to have a match race between each other, and they built it as the Battle of the X's. What was that like when you first heard the idea of that coming around? I was okay with it because Mike and I are friends, but I still was I had feelings for him. So when we did a couple of the interviews, you know, Mike was joking, and he said something about, um, I said, well, if I win, I guess you'll take me out for dinner. And he's like, well, I'll have to ask my girlfriend. Well, at the time, I took it wrong, and I <laughs> I had to leave, and I you know, was crying a little bit. Um, but that was me just being a little bit sensitive. So it was still, at the time, a sensitive topic because we had just freshly broken up. Um, but it was, it was great for racing, I think. I think a lot of the girls that came out to Del Mar were really cheering for me and that was fun and they had buttons and it was girls against guys and it just so happened I you know the horse that I got I had ridden him in the past and you know he's a bit of a tyrant he doesn't always give you his best performance he's very a bit moody and I don't know if they're evenly matched as far as PPs are concerned you know post uh, you know past performance type you know rate racing and that would be you know in a match race, you really have to match them evenly. 
Uh, that all being said, I could, you know, blame anything, but, you know, he did beat me, and, I mean, he's been doing that for a while. I can't wait to get him one day. He's been doing that but, to uh, everyone for a while. <laughs> yeah, it's like, oh, well, I can't, I'm waiting for the day <laughs> to nail him on the wire or beat him, and, uh, yeah, I mean, we're still friends, but I'm sure we've always had a bit of that, well, always had a lot of competition between the two of us and I don't ever bring that into my other relationships I learned my lesson there that don't compete um too much or don't compete at all with the person you're with it's not good now Delmar had no idea that this was going to happen but uh they didn't even need to have the battle of the X's because that that would play out again on a much bigger scale scale on national tv and the breeders cup classic in October at Ch Churchill Downs uh that was actually, I went back and looked at that Breeders' Cup because I wanted to have an idea of Game On Dude's chances in that Breeders' Cup. That was actually one of the storylines that they did not touch on at all. So what was that Breeders' Cup classic like? You, you were on Game On Dude, you turned for home, and you know Game On Dude with his typical running style, he had like four or five horses that were running at him at the top of the stretch. What were your thoughts on his chances of winning the race when you were turning for home well about like just after the three pull i remember johnny v gave a good hard run at me and game on dude almost got his head behind his horse and i'm like oh no we're in so much trouble i can it's over like we're done and then i i dug in and i asked game on dude to, to run and you know, it was a bit early, but he did, and he kept his nose in front, and I said, okay, now we added a little more, and then I remember, so you think the European horse came up the inside on me, and I'm like, oh, God, I left the rail too open, and I'm like, I got to gun him again, so I, I gunned him again, and um, so you think just disappeared. He must have just either got intimidated or he just didn't have enough. The race was a long race, and it was a long stretch, and then I was coasting on my own going, oh, my God, I got this it's happening and it was dark so there was the light at the wire and I'm like I'm so close and then at the side you know my peripheral vision to the right way out in the middle of the track I said oh my god it's Mike and I said you know he knew not to come near him because game on dude is a tenacious little bull you know pit bull and he'll fight and um you know, he, that horse had ifed into the race because he was going to go in the marathon race. And uh, he was coming at a, a speed that I knew I, I wasn't keeping in stride. I said, I'm in trouble here. So I tried everything I could with Game On Dude. But he was also pretty tired. And I think he actually thought it was it was over. Like, it was done. He didn't see anything. And if we were so close to the wire, it was, he thought he won. There was no one around us. And then, and then that happened. So, but I'm, I'm so proud of him because I think he won or he ran a winning race and it was such an honor to be in that moment and just at Churchill Downs, the fans and the way that that racetrack wraps around, you know, the track, the wire and <clears throat> the fans, like the, the, the sound of the, the, the people screaming and the electricity in the air unbelievable what was that so feeling I'm, like you felt like you were home free like past the 16th pole and then mike runs by you just in front of the wire what's that like to go from knowing that believing that you've won the richest horse race in north america to the i just got beat by a short uh, nose yeah uh like getting punched in the gut like just air just taken right from you Did you think that your run with Game On Dude was going to propel you to the level that you had originally thought that you could get to in your career? Or not necessarily thought to, but hoped to? Did you feel like that that would be your sort of big break? I think he was. And I think um, as that was happening, I was realizing it was happening. And I thought, you know, looking back, I probably should have kept on you know, going and not, you know, sort of taking that break from horse racing. Uh, but, you know, a lot goes into it. Like, emotionally, you're so involved with a horse that's so great and you travel the whole world. 
excuse me, and then, you know, to be taken off him after the Pacific Classic where I was second, and, you know, because they said I, you know, my reins slipped out of my hand. I mean, it happens all the time, but it just happened, and I decided not to pick it up because I wanted to get one more jump out of Came On Dude, and anyway, uh, at the time, Bob was like, no, it's no big deal, but you know, everyone's fighting for that mount, so you're going to get a lot of people challenging whether that cost in the race or not. And even if it didn't, they're going to go that direction. But it's a it's a doggy dog world. It's like any profession when you get to the top. You know, people are going to fight for what you have, and everybody wants what you have. And uh, it got taken away, <laughs> and you get emotionally attached to certain horses. And I did with that. Came on, dude. Excuse me. And uh, it was the first time I had to deal with that kind of, um, you know, at the top and then slowly kind of got quiet for me business-wise in California, which, you know, in anything is just a bump on the road and you just ride it out. But uh, I guess I was just at a time where I just needed to take a little time for myself personally. And... Um, you know, I, it, it's just that's kind of what happened. And I kind of, you know, I don't want to say that I got depressed, but I did a little bit. And um, I'd never, ever had that before in my life. I'm a pretty happy person. But, and I've always loved to get up and go to work. And I just didn't want to go to work anymore. I didn't want to do it. I was sad all the time. And I need to get out of a rut. And, you know, I think part of that is, you know, you have to be on your game all the time. And when you, you know, when you are jockeying and you are in a rut or you're not mentally all there and, you know, if you are kind of depressed, people feel that. And I think that's kind of the sense that people were getting. And it just, it was probably a good time to take a break because, you know, you can't always be 100% all the time. And, I, that was a, a moment where I needed some, some time. So I took it, and then it turned into four years, and then I just I just couldn't wait to get back. Like, I was – if I didn't come back to horse racing, I don't know what would happen. I just – always on my mind, um, I just wanted to come back so bad, and I would do anything to be back in the industry. And, um, so I started going back into racing, and then my husband at the time was uh, not happy with that, and – um, I did it anyway, and it just, you know, things didn't work out. <clears throat> now, on May 6, 2017, you won your 1,000th win. What was it like to reach that kind of plateau in your career? Uh, really exciting. I, I really ha- I'm happy that I came back and then, you know, hit that milestone uh, because I've ridden at a lot of, you know, tough tracks and, um, it's just great to say that, you know, as a jockey, I've, you know, been over a thousand races. I know a lot of jockeys have won, you know, a lot more, and, uh, um, but I don't care. <laughs> I, I, you know, hit that milestone, and I know where I've ridden, and I know, um, you know, how hard it's been to, to get that thousand, and I'm proud of myself. I'm happy that I have that, and yeah, so I, I think. Yeah, I'm, I'm so happy that I have that. I'm grateful it happened. You're riding this year, uh, as you said, in Kentucky. Uh, I, unfortunately for you, uh, before uh, Angie actually emailed me and said both your horses got scratched today, so <laughs> yeah. you get a consolation in talking to me. <laughs> but uh, you're riding in Kentucky. You're going to be riding at Ellis Park uh, later in the year. What's it like to ride for people like Larry Jones and those other people that you're riding for? Well, there's a lot of great trainers here, and what I love about Kentucky is there's a lot of trainers, and there's a lot of horses, and there's a lot a lot of different people who have different styles and like different jockeys, and there's a lot of movement, and I, I love that. Larry Jones is such a horseman. He is really good with horses. For owners who are interested in a trainer that is hands-on, who's there, who is uh, very much like a, like really a horsey type guy, and that is just so in tuned and just so gentle and just 
he's, you know, he gets on his horses in the morning. He, he, even in the paddock, he'll lead you out. And instead of a groom leading you out, I just never seen a trainer at his level to continue doing that. And, uh, I think he just loves to do it. He's just a really hard worker and he's just a super nice guy. And I was always intimidated by him until I met him. And, um, he's just a very kind person and, uh, he loves, loves, loves horses. Um, and, uh, I just, it's an honor to ride for him and I'm grateful that he's put me on the horses that he has and I would do anything to, to ride more for him. I think, uh, you know, work horses at Ellis for him. I just, and every time he speaks, uh, you know, he's like an Alan Jerkins or he just has so many, so much knowledge and so much, you know, good things and interesting things to say. Chantel Sutherland joining me for a couple of moments uh, just to let you guys know uh, today we have her uh, it's tomorrow I will be at Suffolk Downs for one of the final two days of racing there also coming up later in the week on Wednesday we have uh, not necessarily an interview but we have uh, Horse Racing Wrongs President Patrick Bottiello on the podcast that's going to be some fireworks there we're going to uh, press him on some of the stuff that he said about horse racing and he's going to come back at me with some other things and then next week, uh, we have Vic Stauffer, former Hollywood Park and current Oakland Park track announcer. Chantel, the last question that I want to ask you is, uh, if you could go back in time to any moment in horse racing, you get, I give you a time machine, you go back, you watch that event live, what would you go back to? Mm. <laughs> uh, I think I would go back to the moment where my, my agent said that we weren't going to work my nut bird. And I wish I had a flew out and worked him that Saturday and then kept him out instead of riding in Canada. I know we rode 13 races on the day, um, but, you know, looking back because he won, if I had to just worked him and never let Calvin get on him, I would have I would have kept him out. I felt, I guess that, <clears throat> that one, that moment would have changed history. Um, and then I wouldn't say the Breeders' Cup Classic because, I mean, it was an exciting moment for sure, but it was so bittersweet. <clears throat> would there be anything that you would just like to go back and see firsthand in person? Uh, like, give me an example. Like, what do you... Like, uh, some people would say, like, seeing Secretary when the Belmont Stakes by 31. Uh, okay. Something like that. Like, my uh, my example for that question is always, I always wish that I could go back and be there for Bill Shoemaker's last race. Oh, wow. You know, one of my favorites is Russian. I would love to see her run. Uh, sorry, you... Uh, my phone cut out for a second. Who was that? Oh, sorry. I would have loved to see seen Ruffian. Ruffian. Run. I, I read her book and... I just thought what a great filly she was. Um, that would have been pretty, pretty cool. Um, Secretariat too. Yeah. All right. Well, Chantel Sutherland was my guest. Thank you for joining me today. Uh, like I said, we got that stuff coming up this week. I will see you guys later, later on for some more content this week. Thank you, Chantel. Thank you too. Dude leads. He's two and a half in front of Richard's kid to the outside who is inching up with every strike. Game on dude has to stay to the task and he's doing it. He's two lengths in front. Richard's kid is trying to run him down, but he cannot get by. Game on dude. Richard's kid. Game on dude.